Football grabs you in a big way, and that'll take us into the, the, the meat of the story. But you're a boxing house. Your dad is an absolute boxing enthusiast, and it's, it permeates through, obviously, with, with Steve's success later in, in life uh, and your own interest in the sport. But what is it about football that, that sort of grabs you in this great romantic way from, from such a young age? George Best. Like, football was football, but he was something different. He was like something from a different planet. And I remember looking at him and thinking, he's brilliant. And my father agreed, even though my father was a boxing man. And then years later, we all boxed, you know. That was it with the gym on the back of the house. And that was our thing, was boxing. But I always liked football, played on the street morning and the night. And then when I got older, <clears throat> I realised boxing wasn't for me. Even though I continued until I was about 17, 16, 17, I took up football. Really took a shine to it. St. George Best with the four coats and the E-type jags. And I remember him pouring the champagne out, all the glasses on the telly and I thought, ah, oh, Jesus, that's for me. Mm. Not a dingy old boxing club, <laughs> damp and wet and cold and going home with blood got, up your it, nose yeah. and a sour face. <laughs> I, I was good at the boxing. Yeah. Till they start trying to hit me back. I thought this is a great sport. And I'm jabbing them and yeah. that's soon they hit me and going, oh, that's not part of the script, you know? But that was it. So no, I took a, the, the, the glamour the attention, there was more attention on football. You know, with a group of lads, and that was just for me. So obviously that was my road. I remember Brendan McCarthy. I was in Arbor Hill Boxing Club. I was at the fight for the youth heavyweight title and got beaten. And I remember telling Brendan I'm getting a trailer full of him. And he said to me, well, what do you love the most? I said, football. Well, go, he said, because you have to love boxing more. To achieve anything, that was it, you know? And anyway, I went over. And who was there on the George Best? Well, I knew that before I went, and I could not believe this. This was like um, the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, even if it only lasted one day, hmm. just to meet this man who I idolised. And uh, I did. And he was a lovely, lovely fella. He treated you well. He treated me well. I mean, I was a nobody, obviously. But I remember me and Paddy McCarthy, who came with me, sitting down the change room, and he sat between the two of us, and he put his arm around Paddy, because Paddy was a bit homesick. And he was talking to telling about how he felt as a kid and all that. He didn't have to do that. And I remember being picked on the five-side team with George Best. And they all called him Bestie. Mm. And I was calling him Bestie. Yeah. And every time I got the ball, she wanted to pass to George, you know. And then to me, I got the ball, I go, Bestie, Bestie, Bestie. Oh, man. It was unbelievable. It was like a dream. And even when I sit down now, I think, did that really happen to me? And it did. It was brilliant. And he was a lovely man. Yeah, try as a Fulham, Arsenal and Wolves. You weren't picked up. Yeah. Uh, was that crushing for you? Was that disappointing for you? And how do you reflect on it now? Oh, well, do you know what's the most disappointing for me, Tom, was you go over from Ireland and someone asks you to come, pay for everything, bring you over, and then they don't even talk to you. And you're thinking, like, what's this all about? Like, I thought, in my innocence, first flight ever in my life, I was arriving over there, and there's going to be a superstar when I arrived. She had just thrown into a little corner, and you left with all of other kids on trial. I was a physical kid. And if I whacked somebody in train, I'd apologise. You know what I mean? If I gave a ball away, I'd apologise. I spent my whole time, particularly at Arsenal, because it was such a high standard, apologise because I was probably doing that much wrong. Yeah. So Arsenal didn't work for me. It didn't work at all. And uh, John Devine done his utmost, and Frank Stout was very kind to me. John Devine was brilliant. He was getting into the team or thereabouts, and he'd done everything in his power to help me, to, to encourage me and be friendly with me, and but look, it just, I wanted to go home. So bouncing back from that first experience in England means life with Caroline. Yeah. Also means uh, being an apprentice plasterer, a trade that would stand to you uh, well throughout the years, through all the ups and downs. Football then with Bohemians. So you jo join Bowes and, and you get to play UEFA Cup game uh, in Lisbon against Sporting, where you play a stormer, and it feels like things are going back on track, but then you break your leg. Yeah, it was, like, I come back... Uh, from England, I was 18, 19, I actually turned 19. I was well into a relationship with Karen. We were going to be together forever. That was done and dusted. So I didn't have to worry about her going out on a Saturday night. So I was happy in my skin, happy in, in my apprenticeship as a plaster. And I was happy playing my football. And I signed for balls. And I'll never forget it. The game wasn't two minutes on. And a ball broke. And I went flying in. The next thing I heard... It was like, it was like, I could hear it, the branch of a tree snapping, mm. right? And I remember the other lad going that way and he was in agony and I looked down and my knee was that way, facing the north and my foot was facing 
Galway. My dad was on the line with Stephen. Michael Henry was on the line with Georgie Dillon, my two pals. And I remember Billy coming and throwing his coat over my leg. But when I went to the hospital, I was in traction for six weeks in the bed. It didn't work out. Then it didn't heal. Then I was in a cast for, I think, six months. Then we we're going to break it and put a plate in. Then oh, it was a disaster. So it took me about, I think I'd done my first jog in the Phoenix Park after about 18 months. I'll never forget it. And it was probably one of the happiest nights of my life. Carla going down with me and she was timing me jogging. Mm. Probably took me an hour to get around the polo grounds, but it was the happiest thing I ever done. To get back in your feet. To get back, yeah. Um, you do get back and you get back playing, but you're hit with another blow, um, another really, really huge personal blow not long after that when you lose your father, Roddy. Um, he was only 49 and you were with him shortly before you, you, you lost him. And how did that affect you, do you think, um, looking back on it now? Uh, right. Well, personally, it was devastation. Take your time. Football wise, it was like, I had no interest. Mm. I had no interest. I, I just, I had no interest. I gave it up. I gave it up. And, uh, just. Have, have you. Thought more about him uh, go, going through writing the book as it sort of uh, put into context the, the role he had. Well, do you know what, Tom? I think about him all the time. He was my idol. I wanted to achieve for him as well as everyone else. And uh, that happened. So I went a little bit off, off the radar. I stopped. Was, there was no interest. Carla was pregnant, right? Yeah. So that, thank God, got me back on track. I had to start getting my head together for that one. I remember the day before my dad died, we played in our uh, Mel's Park. And I remember after, my dad knew nothing about football, but I remember after every game, I'd come and sit in the end of his bed. He'd wait up for me, and I'd come in and I'd go, right, Dan, he'd go, blah, blah, blah. I remember coming in and he goes, they're brutal. You have to get out of there, you know? And he was right. You know, it wasn't where I expected I should have been and mm. wanted to be. Like, Bowes was a big club. Anyway, so then what happened with Dad the next day? That, that was devastating. So I didn't care about nothing in life. Nothing. Only Caroline. And then realising we I was going to be a father very, very soon. I went back to Dave. who was a lovely man. And I remember sitting with him in his travel agency over on Balls Bridge. And I begged him to, to cancel my registration. And he did. He understood, I was distraught, you know. And I went back to Billy, and Billy took me back more and I was empty. Yeah. In actual, you know, so I felt something was getting back on track in my life. I was back with people like Terry Everson, who I looked up to, you know, and I was back with people around the club like Austin Brady, that made me feel good. And then I started to go around my life the best I could. Then Caroline's father dropped dead, sitting on the edge of his chair. He was getting ready for a, for a wedding. Carla's sister Sandra was getting married, and Sandra was at the show in a Dara wedding dress. So I sat down, and Billy just went, looked around, he went, Phew. that was it. Pulled him out on the floor, we did what we were doing, and Billy was gone. So then there was a wedding the weekend, it was a double wedding with Alan and Sandra and, and, and Alan's sister Angela. So they had to go ahead, right? And then four weeks later, Caroline gives birth. And I said to in the book, it was like a scene out of Snapper, because of all the, the sadness, suddenly we used this little baby girl, and they were all running in with balloons, and it was unbelievable. And then, you know, we just, when you think back, we're down a hell. Like, in your lifetime, you march on. But when mm. you actually put that down, that was a little block of pure grief. And then Sinead came out of it. And she's been brilliant. Yeah. She was she was brilliant, you know.